before we close this first morning of the conference, we will welcome Dan Reading. Dan Reading is head of sustainability at World Sailing, the International Federation for the Sport of Sailing. He is responsible for the delivery of the award-winning sustainability program. I guess um, Dan is already with us. Hi, Dan. Hi there. How are you? Very good, thank you. Nice to nice to see you, and thanks to uh, all the previous speakers. Been some really uh, some some really insightful content today. So it, it's we will give you the the closing speech. So I I don't know what it's very inspiring to see what uh, the the word sailing is actually doing. So if you can tell us more about what the program is. Sure, it'd be my pleasure. Okay, thanks. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um, well, yeah, as I said, I'm delighted to uh, to be here. So thanks to Surf Rider Europe for, for inviting me. Um, and uh, I'll try and wrap up um, what's been a really insightful day. Um, and thanks again to some of the previous speakers. Good luck to Mathieu and Theo uh, on your swim later this year. I look forward to seeing how you get on and following that. Um, I'd also like to briefly thank the translators who've helped me understand uh, some of the content and uh, slightly improve my French, hopefully. Um, so first of all, yeah, I was asked to do um, a closing, some closing remarks and to, to give some anecdotes about how the sports sector has really started to transition to be more sustainable itself, but hopefully inspire and challenge uh, those of you that are working in the sector um, who are on this call today. And I think it's key that the sports sector is becoming more sustainable itself, but I suppose unlike other sectors where you have this ripple effect that has the ability to bring fans and participants with it. So the potential to engage with a much wider audience to educate and to use supply chain value chain uh, to create positive change is something that is fairly unique, I think, to, uh, to sport. And that's something that that's been touched upon today. So I've been fortunate enough to work in the sustainability and sports sector now for about 15 years um, and that's included working at a national federation and national governing body um, to international federation where I am now um, as part of the sustainability team at London 2012 um, and of course my own sports clubs of which I'm a member so from grassroots um, all the way to uh, uh, kind of uh, elite sport um, not that I've competed in elite sport by the way but um, <laughs> uh, helping participate well helping to to manage some of the sustainability activity during those uh, uh, big events um, so World Sailing for those of you who don't know um, where I'm currently head of sustainability it's the governing body for the sport of sailing but that encompasses windsurfing, kiteboarding, um, big boats, um, dinghy sailing, Olympic, say, Olympic classes. So we have 115 classes of boats. Uh, we sanction um, some of the, well, the biggest events in the sport. Um, and events like this, I absolutely love joining um, forces, I suppose, with other like-minded individuals. Um, and why you might ask, well, the sustainability team at World Sailing consists of just one person. Um, and that's me. So, so actually what I've found, particularly through events like this and um, uh, it, it, well, I suppose since the pandemic where there's been more kind of online um, events, but the sector is extremely open to sharing ideas um, and, and resources. So I've certainly benef benefited from a lot of interactions um, with colleagues in the sector and some of which are, have, have been on today and will be on tomorrow as well. So um, some, some really valuable um, insights. I think bar the largest sports entities, most will not have large um, teams to deliver sustainability. And for me, one of the things I always encourage people to do if you're working in this space is to form strategic partnerships. And um, it, one of the previous speakers mentions that it can be from your sponsors where actually you, you might be um, you might benefit from having a sponsorship of a, a large corporation, which will probably have a sustainability team of you know, um, 10 to 50 people. So, so actually, can you, can you lean on them a little bit and get that expertise? Um, when I was um, fortunate enough to be part of the London 2012 sustainability team, um, I think there, there, was, there was quite a broad team um, with, with different focus areas, but also 
um, working with the sponsors uh, and seeing how they would help on particular parts of that mission. And I think it's really exciting that Paris 2024, what, what they're going to be doing and, and from experiencing home games where <laughs> you've got sustainability as a key pillar of the of the organization you will see that that acts as a catalyst absolutely um, and i think there's lots of exciting uh, opportunities and i'll briefly mention about um, something that's particularly exciting from the marine um, part with paris 2024 um, but i'll talk a little bit that, about that later um, so as, as i mentioned sport has an audience like no other um, the olympic games alone reaches 3.2 billion people huge um, and it, that, it, it's crazy and i think sport in some capacity reaches the lives of virtually everybody um, on the planet whether that's through participation or following it as a fan um, so with that reach comes the responsibility a significant responsibility to be a positive force uh, globally on some of the big challenges of our time and i think that's what we're starting to see a transition of um, you know acting more purposefully so I think when when you're looking to to create that well either your purpose um, how you engage and how you use effective communication is absolutely key um, and also educating and motivating our audiences on pro-environmental behavior is something that we can all do and creating buy-in is important um, one of my colleagues is quite keen on what we call an elevator pitch so that's where you effectively get 30 seconds to, to kind of pitch your idea. So you're going in an elevator. And <laughs> actually for, for the sustainability topics, um, I had to generate effectively six or seven for the same concept. It's because different people have different motivations. So communicating to them a way which satisfies their needs, I suppose, is, is essential. Um, and so for many, that will be protecting the playground, the playground being the planet. Others will be about um, finding commercial opportunities. But, but either way, um, when, when we did it at, at World Sailing, we had to effectively get 146 countries to all agree that this is something strategically that the organization is going to, to work on. And, and what we did is um, a program for the next 12 years, so quite a big um, decision. Um, and what we used was the universal language, I suppose, of the Sustainable Development Goals. So the SDGs um, and using that as a, a, a reference point. So we know all countries have adopted that. So the national federations in our case, that it was something that resonated with them and they could more easily um, translate it to what, what, it might, what it might mean. And also that's really good for sponsors because corporates, what we found is they're us usually using the SDGs as their kind of reference point. So how we can engage um uh, with some of those is, is absolutely key and i've got a good a really good um well i think it's good where it's, it's a comment from one of our uh key sponsors it was kind of buried in in an email um it was an internal email from uh the organization and that what they said was millions of people are interested in sailing billions of, of people are interested in sustainability so actually what we're starting to see is more kind of activation from the sponsors that they, you know, they typically use sport as a way of engaging fans, but if they've got ambitions about sustainability um, and they, they sync with yours, there's great opportunities to, uh, to really get some meaningful um, uh, work completed and, and something that, that benefits both parties. Um, and so our sport, it relies on nature and sometimes mother nature doesn't always play along. Um, so when there's too much wind or not enough, um, as well as tides and all that kind of stuff as well. But um, what we decided, we would we'd seek that opportunity. Sailing can be a technical sport, so typically there's tuition involved, and um, we're a sport that has infrastructure comprised of clubs um, all, all over the all over the world. So we created educational resources for sailing clubs. We've put it in twelve different languages, um, aimed at six to twelve year olds. Uh, and part of that, we, we teach them about the, the Vendée Globe, the America's Cup, some sailing terminology. And, um, but also what we decided to do is also have lots of sustainability themed um, content, which links to sailing. So talking about biodiversity and climate change, so making them more climate literate. And something that occurred to me, I had a, um, a, a sort of an, an interview the other day with, um, it's, it, 
it's the organization that looks after environmental professionals of which I'm a member and they asked me why how did I get into the sustainability sector my answer was relatively simple is that I spent a lot of time as a as a kid um, outside playing in the outdoors um, and also I think I had a couple of good teachers um, involved in environmental science and geography so actually then it starts to make me think that all the sports especially the outdoor ones that you're effectively you know we've got millions if not billions of of kids participating and we're we're starting to to educate them to be more climate literate and um, about some of the other um uh, kind of well biodiversity and, and issues that um that have been talked about today i'm hoping there's going to be a tidal wave of sustainability environmental practitioners in the next uh, sort of decade or, or years to come because we've nurtured that um, the love of uh, nature being outside participating it doesn't have to be competitive but then also giving them that education um, linked to the sport which is something that I don't think I had that particular link as a kid but um, hopefully that's something that we can uh, as I said we can nurture so so we monitor how our audience responds to our work and uh, as a recent uh, a recent event we had 93 percent of participants and these are from 65 countries um, it was a youth worlds event 93 percent of them um, said the focus on sustainability enhanced the event and i use that stat quite a lot because you know this is our next i mean the the athletes for us are the customer and you know there's this expression the customer's always right and where we have such, uh, uh, well, the overwhelming majority who are saying actually putting sustainability integrated into this event has made it better. So why wouldn't we do that for all the events that um, that, that we run um, in the future? And that, that's what we will do. But I kind of encourage other organizations to, to find about, Definitely. you know, you can have incremental improvements, but find out how that's uh, perceived. Some of it might be behind the scenes. Some of it might be more... Um, uh, obvious to the participant, participants but that's something that we found really um, worked for us and justified the effort um, that, that we put in. Um, so as such we have sustainability requirements in contracts for all of our World Cups, World Championships, um, we also have a, a comprehensive sustainability charter so for the really big events like the Ocean Race, LGP um, etc that is actually into the in the contracts but it uses their uh, R&D budgets, the, um, the resources that they have to collectively work together. So we do have other projects with multi-sports actually, so um, carbon fibre recycling is one of them and someone mentioned earlier about um, linking different um, sports and I think there's going to be a lot more of that. Where yeah, we the have partnership. Simi- a- absolutely, and where we have similar objectives, it, it totally makes sense, you know, instead of going in silos, working together on some of this. Um, but that, that being said, you know, it's, it's one thing where well, it's great to see the kind of high performance athletes um, become role models and influence the next generation. But when somebody's looking at 150 million euro America's Cup campaign and they're sailing their 40 year old dinghy, in, <laughs> there, there's a bit of a, a difference. And by the way, I've got a 40 year old dinghy. And so it, you, you've got to work out where the kind of, you know, there's the there's the elites and the, the top events but the grassroots and in terms of scalability the grassroots is much much bigger and um, arguably much more impact if you can um, if you can make impact if you can make changes at grassroots level so um, that with that in mind one of the things that that we created was an online self-assessment so bearing in mind we're doing this internationally um, in, a, in a national role I audited about 350 sailing clubs doing environmental audits and more often than not it would be this you know there would be kind of the same five ten things that needed to change quick wins quite easy to do it just needed a sort of a second set of eyes um, and some recommendations of how you go through that process so we've we've kind of used that experience and made it international so we have this uh, toolkit 150 questions it gives you it's very interactive it gives you gives users case studies it gives them a score a benchmark right. score and it gives them examples of other clubs and how they've uh, achieved it so um, I think there's still e- even now um, there's there's still lots of opportunities in that area and I'd encourage kind of grassroots by either federations but um, to, to look at how they work with grassroots in this way because ultimately 
there's lots of I made lots of cost savings at clubs yeah, even if it's 100 200 euros actually more often than not it's three to five thousand euros but that could be reinvested in the club and I often say to them it's easier to get it's easier to do some sustainability um, kind of quick wins looking at your energy use um, water use etc and it's easier to save two thousand euros than it is to get 10 new members which will cost which which will bring in um, two thousand euros revenue in many cases so reinvesting in the sport making it more sustainable there's lots of um, opportunities and i think um, other sports will uh well the, the tools that we've got i'd say 80 percent of it is relevant to any clubhouse it's just we also have a few bits about stuff in the water as well as you expect um but i just thought i i, I then I, I touched a little bit on the uh what we're doing with um paris 2024 um we developed something called uh, challenge 2024 so um it's it's uh, an initiative that's aimed to target the marine industry so um previous speakers have talked about the value chain how we can influence and we can um as certainly federations we we regulate we we have the rules we specify equipment etc um so for the olympics um, in this case, we jointly, I suppose, we specify what boats are used as support boats. I mean, we also specify which sailing boats can be used, but the support boats. So if you think about when the Olympics happens, you see someone uh, windsurfing. Big. Yeah. And, and actually, from my time at London 2012, we captured the carbon footprint of all the support boats being used. And it was pretty significant. You know, it's um, it, it was a lot of fuel because more often than not every boat on the water a sailing boat on the water would have a coach um in uh what we call a rib with a petrol engine a combustion engine on the back so we were starting to think how can we how can we change this and you know there's a few regulations so we're cutting numbers by 50 percent but there's also a safety component so we have to there does have to be boats in the water so then we started to think about okay well let's see if we can act sport and uh Paris 2024 can act as a catalyst to the marine industry to transition to um, electric hydrogen propulsion. Now, in the marine sector, you have marinas, you have charging infrastructure, which is already there. So that's great. Um, and actually, there's not much regulation to, to, to encourage this transition. So we thought we'll create this, this challenge. And it's been, it's been fantastic. The response has been great. We've got lots of companies that have invested um, in this technology. Uh, I think a lot of them saw that Elon Musk was now, I think, the richest mm -hmm. person in the world. So they had aspirations to <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe get there as well. But but actually what, what it shows is that you know, the, the amount of boats that are used for Olympics and elite competition as support yeah. boats is minute. But what we're doing is we're effectively changing the industry based on that kind of pyramid, the boats used at the mm -hmm. top end of the sport. Um, and I think that that shows that, you know, that's one example. And we, we hear about applied technologies. We hear about Formula One, Formula E and, and other sports about how some of the regulation changes they have will potentially trickle down into what we see in the automotive sector in, yeah. in uh, you know, a few years time. So I think uh, there's lots of opportunities for, for other sports there. And that's really exciting. Um, and, and again, looking at I mentioned about the the R&D, so where some uh, teams or entities have, have big budgets and um, for us I talked about we're looking at the re well, recycling of carbon fiber also recycling of glass reinforced plastic which some boats are made out of also wind turbines bathrooms it's a it's an issue that um, is multi across lots of industries but we're hoping we can act as a um, a catalyst to, uh, to, to to target that problem um, so I think having common um, purpose uh, and, and having sports that can link up together and, and partner, uh, that's something that, that we've done. Uh, we're, we're always open to, uh, well, we encourage kind of uh, strategic partnerships and, and uh, linking with other sports. And finally, I, I think one of the things I wanted to, to end on is uh, um, there's a, a campaign to protect 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. Uh, and we've teamed up with the World Surf League and Surfrider are, are also a member. So we are oneocean.org. We've got about se uh, 60 um, NGOs 
all trying to get a million signatures uh, by the uh, uh, well by around October time um, to use that to, to showcase kind of the water sports community does want to ensure the protection of its its playground for for generations to come. So that's I think what, what I'd like to to end on. Um, it's been a really interesting uh, day, and I look forward to hearing some of the uh, um, the, the topics and the conversations tomorrow. But um, I'd happily take any questions if uh, if there are any. Well, thank you so much. It was very interesting to see uh, the all, all what the the sailing federation is doing, the work sailing is doing. It's very impactful, and uh, I just wanted to to thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for everything you you do with work sailing. Um, this is the end of the first morning of the of the conference. Thank you so much for following us uh, today. Thank you so much to the panelists we, who actually made this morning an absolutely inspiring morning. I've learned so much, so I guess the public learned a lot too. Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow, tomorrow half past nine for the second morning of the conference. We will stay, we'll have many panelists, great people to, to speak to. So thank you so much for following us today and see you tomorrow.